turning around from the second session. So this session probably a bit closer to the heart of us all as we are working with an HK and mostly these days with dementia and experience these things. So I'm not going to use my list help here and move everything. So just again, this is um, for my training and assessor course. This is for my training and assessor course, the second one, it follows on to the first one and um, it's on behaviours of concern. So the objective of this um, session is uh, the behaviours of concern. Um, a bit of a cent person person centred approach, which um, is what is which is GSL's preference in approach. Um, uh, developing and in that sense, developing a, a positive response. Um, but then my little bit of a input to the session is identifying a personal reaction to behaviors of concern and some self-reflection which is um, my take on behaviors of concern. So <coughs> in identifying behaviors of concern we all actually do know when somebody has got a behavior that has got a behavior so it's not hard to identify that. But um, mostly, of course, it is when we, that person puts himself in harm's way or somebody else in harm's way. Then um, part of the identifying is uh, assessment, doing assessment. Most of us just do it mentally. When you go through the process, you are just automatically do assessment and see, oh, this is happening. Uh, often, um, I know in the mining industry, they have forms that they have to fill out to assess a situation. Um, so that there's a mind process in that, and I think when we are mature, we automatically do these these processes. Sometimes um, in training, we try to identify the process because we don't just assume that people can automatically do the process. Um, you know, with maybe somebody that's just finished year ten and haven't had the experience, they might have to learn to work through the assessments. Then I'm um, looking at the individual and they identifying it within their scope, um, the frequencies and the triggers, and then of course the paperwork. We're all now recording those behaviors of concern, how important that is. Mm. Document. <coughs> Document. Yeah. Mm. So the risk of harm, just going through those points, um, is being um, the definition of referring to the likelihood that somebody um, might experience uh, harm, embarrassment, inconvenience or unfairness. So it's not just actual physical harm, but as far as I put themselves in an embarrassing position or might feel um, unfair in the situation. So I want to talk a little bit about a functional assess assessment. I did quite a bit of research on that. It's a bit of a hard one to understand and sometimes I think within our scope of work it's not always encouraged and we probably don't do it but it is um, something that um, can be very helpful by doing a functional, functional assessment identifying um, the behavior so it is it's like a scale you work out and you look how often does it happen um, and comparing it with um, different times of the day. Um, they do this kind of thing often with uh, children with learning difficulties, but it's something that can be adjusted in the HK facility as well. So you can try to identify without having to call the EB mass in what is the actual reason for somebody doing that because we all know people are doing or are having these behaviors and sometimes we just write it off as well that's their behavior but if you try to make a functional assessment of the whole situation might try you might find out why you might find the triggers why by collecting a whole lot of different um, 
data, a whole lot of different data in different times of the day and um, comparing it with, you know, what happened yesterday this time? What is different today to yesterday? Now, we all know and we've seen that certain people triggers other people, you know, it might be the staff. Um, then what is it about the staff? What are they doing that triggers that person? And then, of course, that's another thing that we always get asked why, or what's the reason, and we all just put dementia, which is probably not 100% correct. But then we also are hesitant to put our hypothesis in there because it, you know, we're not meant to presume or assume. No. But at the same time, by presuming and assuming, you might be able to identify mm. what the problem is. And that is actually what's going to give you the answer. If you can't identify, if you can't um, work out a hypothesis, then you, you know, the behavior is going to continue. Because, and we are facing these issues. We all know we're facing these issues and it's just becoming harder and harder because of the less drugs are being prescribed and we are not enough. That's We all know we're not enough staff, so that makes the job double as hard because how do you make a functional assessment if there's not enough staff? Yeah. How do you fill out all this paperwork? And then developing a plan. Now, this is a team exercise and it has to, you know, probably happen in a team and we probably can't instigate it, but it's good to know that that is part of the process that DB Mass will use when um, they come in and look at somebody, spend time with somebody. Yet they can actually not make the right call because they're not there all the time. They cannot really make a real functional assessment unless they're there morning, night, morning, afternoon and night time at every meal with all the different factors that plays the role. So um, it's only really the people that are working with the people that can make this uh, assessment uh, a success. Which I'm in the middle of doing right now. So it's, you know, you can, I, I can find you the tools that I looked at and I will provide you with some paperwork if you're interested in um, the sister chart with little blocks in and then it just has little <coughs> behaviours down and hours of the day on top and you can just tick when the behaviours happen and perhaps just keep it with you and try to get the mental picture or overall picture, you know. Yeah. Um, Try to sit and just get it over, over all that's a functional assessment and then try to make, um, try to identify what happened before um, the behavior occurred. So, like becoming a detective, identifying um, why they do things. So, you know, um, it is scratching a bit around. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we need more staff to be able to really be successful in this. So the personal centered approach, it is also um, not just uh, from the Tipa Snow, but there is also some courses online from uh, Dementia, uh, but not from Dementia Australia, but from um, training.gov, which most of our things come from. There is a course in this uh, unit, it's actually from training.gov, this personal centered approach, which they actually apply more in uh, another setting, they don't apply it. At the moment, training that can't apply it to dementia training, which they don't really do. They just do uh, personal care type thing. But so the personal centered approach, yeah, deep uh, snow is very good. It is very good. It is not really always applicable to the Australian standard. Now, um, to understand it, I don't know if you've gone for any deep snow training yet. No. So she's an American lady that. Um, talks about approaching the elderly um, in a you know personal way and I'll be carrying on a little bit later by, by looking at by us looking at ourselves and understanding what a personal approach is. I'll be going a little bit more in depth with it. But you can actually look online at some videos on YouTube as well and she has some nice little ideas, some really insightful things about um, how to approach people personally. Um, for instance, when when, it, when she talks about behaviours of concern, she talks about coming in too close when you are too <coughs> close to somebody that, or, or you know, making people feel uncomfortable. And um, the natural reaction 
for most of us is flight or fight. Mm -hmm. So she talks about things like that. Mm -hmm. So either you're going to run a box or you're going to run. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> so <coughs> understanding that, I'm going a little bit more in depth with that. So in how to um, do a personal approach, we have to look at the over, overview of the, the characteristics of the person, understanding the person. And for us, I mean, we all love that, going to read people's history, their life history, getting to know who they are, talking to their family. Sometimes there's huge gaps in, in those histories. We don't know. We don't know. And as much as we would love to know, it's very hard for us as AINs, we're all AINs, to be able to, to get that information. Um, I do try to talk to um, the elderly before they become too demented, but even then sometimes the information are already a little bit, you know, not 100% correct, but still it's their, their view, it's from, from where they are at. So um, their physical and mental health um, in the personal approach, how, how, you know, obviously taking in consideration all their aches and pains mm. and you know, when they walk around and cry like Ian, because he saw mostly, it's not always an emotional thing, mm -hmm. it's sometimes more physical pain. Um, past experiences, we all have seen that. Who are they, you know? Mm -hmm. What jobs did they do? Um, the person has a cute one where the lady is eating a little thing on the chair the whole time and, and then she goes in and she swaps it around with a cloth and then the lady, and she was actually cleaner. Mm -hmm when she was younger and she's sick of a racket and irritating everyone around her. Um, the skills and limita limitations. So, yeah, again, some of these things are really frustrating because we, we don't, in our scope of practice, we don't really have the authority to use these skills. So yes, this person can still, let's let, let's let them. <laughs> You know, let's allow them to still use their personal skills. Um, and what can they not do? You know, I mean, it's small things we know, like letting them brush their own teeth if they can still, uh, things like that. All right. So, um, looking at the individual and these different things, um, the relationships, as I was saying, um, very important that people, some, some of the residents still have very good relationships with <coughs> some of their family members. I could see my grandchildren, there's here and there some grandchildren, a grandchild that has got quite a good relationship with man or, you know, um, so trying to understand the dynamics of... Um, we can come back again. I'll come back for seconds of the recording So then, uh, in the in the personal, um, you know, in the press, person centered approach, we talk about their needs. Um, so I think that's where Deepa Sna talks just about physical needs quite a bit. She talks about being hungry or thirsty or um, you know having to go to the bathroom or being tired. Um, but there's more than just that. Physical needs is just one aspect, and we just got heaps of other little things. But there's also personality needs. Like, I'm a borderline introvert. I love people, but not before 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm. Or even, say, 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I need my time by myself. I recharge by being by myself. Um, then. I think I'm okay. That's why I work well in the afternoon. I won't do well in the mornings, early in the mornings. Um, where extroverts get their energy from people, they come alive when they go out, when, you know, when they get involved, and that's when they only like really wake up because they recharge from, they get their energy from people. So that's where personality needs plays a role. Um, I'm going to go to that anyways, but I'll just mention it as I'm just going there. When I'm old, I would like to stay in my room until at least 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, I'd like to be by myself. And I wouldn't like to sit out with other people all day long. Yeah. You know, it's a positive approach in this relationships and being real. And um, there's nothing worse than somebody that 
is not real. I mean, uh, we've all been we've all worked with those that are falsely friendly or um, overly. Um, they they think they're compassionate, but they actually pity. They you know they go up in and oh shame you know and the whole time they they seem it just doesn't seem natural. It just doesn't seem real and. Um, that authenticity, it's, it's so important when, you, when you're genuine and you're real with somebody and forming a connection with them, um, empowering, letting, having pity, and then curiosity about them and allowing them to be curious. Yeah, yeah okay. Right. Well, it's going again, but it keeps on stopping. I'll just you do it also. Yeah, so I've only got 20 minutes so it's half way now. Okay. Um, so that's part of the positive approach, which we in any ways do. So best practice, which is just um, reflecting on the rights and the choices. We have spoken about that um, so many times. And, you know, people, oh, there's a lot of push on here. Yeah, it's their choice. They want to, if they want to, just let them be. But um, their right is also to be respectful. They have a right to be respectful, and you know, they have a, um, a ability, their needs, their goal as a person. We still have goals, no matter how old we are. We still have goals. We still, they still sometimes live in their own world where they think they, you know, they are still in a position where they're still in a job or they're still doing things, you know, and it, it might be. Um, not true, but it's real to them. So they've got to get up and go to school tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Just empower, empower their personal choices. Um, by how do we do it? On accommodating um, their lifestyle preferences, um, interventions. We all know, you know, how to try to distract and intervene. Um, and then a big thing which we are been trying to do, and I think we are doing it very successfully in Whitehaven is changing work, work practices, you know, trying to go away from a certain way that we've always done things mm -hmm. to try to accommodate and try to do it differently and then um, being supportive and supporting them. So I'm going to the second part of the session now. So started off with identifying behaviours, identifying people, identifying um, the individual and the approach towards the individual and then going into a personal reflection thinking about taking it back into ourselves because we are humans and when we take it back to ourselves we might develop a better understanding if we can put ourselves literally in their shoes if we can start um, you know, just identify characteristics. Why does things irritate me? Who am I? You know, where? You know, wh why does this have effect on me? And that kind of thing. As well as, what would I like to be when? You know, how would I like to be treated when I'm 80, for instance? You know, if we put ourselves in that place, and it's a um, great encouragement, really, that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about making a living will um, and a living will is that making a plan for when you retire I was I mean um, <coughs> talks about it quite often so when we reach Haiti what would you know how would we approach it so we can stay together because quite often we see families being separated how can we make a plan now by putting plans in place before the time so that when you need it those plans are in place and that it becomes a legal document that people can respect and the only way you can do that is by doing a bit of self-reflection by sitting down and thinking about where are you at and what do you like and putting those things in place so somebody has a document to go by I only want to get up this time I only want to do it this way mm. So, um, yeah, making a little bit of a list for yourself. I mean, you can use it at the back of that paper if you'd like to do that, if you think of things. 
you can also just shout it out to me. I've shouted some of my things on the board here. Um, uh, my personal likes and dislikes. I love my family. I love music. I love blues. I love Joan Armour trading in the blues. I love older people. I've always loved older people. All my friends, all when I was younger, is always the older people. I'm a bit like Leanne, you know. <laughs> old soul. I like old people. I love little kids. You know, I love interacting with little kids. I love red, red wine and a, and a fire <laughs> and camping, you know. Um, my social preferences, I said earlier, you know, I'm an introvert, so borderline introvert, extrovert, so I need time by myself sometimes. Um, I'm, also, I'm also a bit of a um, devil's advocate. I always try to, you know, even when somebody is in the wrong, I try to see their side of the story and you know, try to advocate for them. So um, I'm friendly and... You know, that's, that's who I am. So I'm thinking of these things and I'm looking at myself and, and then I think when I'm that age, how would I like to these things to apply to my care plan and what I would like? I think, if I may say something, a big thing there is um, food. Because some of the residents are Chinese, um, Filipinos, Chinese, um, Italians, mm. and they don't like the same food as what the Australians eat. No. But some of them don't get catered to. No. It's always just the same food. Yes. And I think that's a big role. Yeah, well, because right. like we spoke in the earlier, in the previous session about culture, it's the same thing that, that comes through, you know, you see the... the, the the connection and that, uh, you know, being, looking at yourself and where you're from yeah. and identifying that. So the value of looking at yourself, and having this self-reflection. Sorry, and I just remember we had a resident who doesn't like eggs, mm. but every Thursday they get eggs and there was nothing else for her. She just had to eat the eggs. Um, oh, really? That's terrible. We actually, for the first time, ever they got asked what they would like for their menus yeah i saw that they had menus going around and they had choices that's what they did in the uk that's yeah. that probably something that came from the uk mm. yeah. so that's lovely yeah there's somebody going I mean, around every morning going we have a couple order. that just really cannot fathom what they will eat anyway and of course we need to make that decision for them so they're still getting their their food and their nutrition but there's lots still there that can make a decision whether they want chops or steak for yeah, tea. Very nice. So they got asked. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And that's environment, oh, yeah. you know, that's really that environment which is really good. So yes, so we when we start um, looking at the value of self reflection, self reflection is the capacity of humans to e exercise introspection. Um, and the willingness to learn about their fundamental nature and purpose and essence. So, I love that word, introspection. It, um, I love words and I love word play, but I will um, elaborate on that in a little bit. But thinking about who you are, what do you think? What did you think? How did you think a few years ago? How do you think you are going to think? <laughs> you all. What do you say? What did you What did you say in the past? What do you think you will say in the future? Mm -hmm. You know. I hate to think. Um, <laughs> what will you do? You know. How, how would you react when all the all the voices come down? <laughs> <laughs> What's going to be? The filter's so, broken. <laughs> introspection. Um, the fundamental nature and purpose and essence the definition set. It's the crossroads, the intersection, introspection, life's intersection. Now, often, more than often, this only ha happens when we lose somebody. We don't always do this as a natural exercise. We don't always go sit down and, you know, think about, hmm, uh, you know, who's the people that love me and where am I, you know, 
We don't, th unfortunately this only <coughs> happens when your life reaches a crossroad or you, you um, lose everything somehow and you have to reevaluate who you are. So um, it's maybe today could be a, you know, a small crossroad for you to, to just take a bit of time and do a bit of introspection. I, I know my life changed 180 degrees when my first husband died. And not long after that when my grandma died, you know, it all happened like in one year. I changed completely. I was a complete different person. You would not believe if I tell you who I was. I was a completely different person and I changed because there was this massive shock and mm. I sat there and I, and, you know, and I was staring out in the nothingness and I was, you know, I was trying to work through all of this, thinking, what have I done with my life so far? Where am I going? Who am I? You know, what do I want to be in the future? What do I want to leave behind for my children when I'm not here anymore? So, um, this examination that we have mm -hmm. is taking a bit of time out in our lives and, and just thinking about, you know, um, where do we come from? Where do we see ourselves in the future? What gives us joy in life? What are the things that are really important? Who's the people that are really important in our lives? Um, who do we, you know, who, who loves us? Who do we love? So, how to gain this perspective? I mean, we all know, but this is kind of like a little reminder that we can take time to talk to people. Take, genuinely talk to people. You know, get to know somebody. Make new friends. Um, talk to the elderly. Jeez, I always think, you know, if you think about that, if somebody is 100 years old today, which is some of our residents are 100, mm -hmm. they come from the Penny Lane bicycle to the moon, if they went to the moon, mm. you know, the, the speed of the technology, that mm. what they've seen, you know, what, where have they been, some of them have been in the world wars, they, mm. um, they've gone through so much, if we can, you know, if we can just get a little bit of that um, knowledge from them, a bit of that uh, world view that they have, that they've gone through, it's just amazing, and what we, we can gain through that. Reading, reading a beautiful book. Antoinette put me in, um, gave me a set of books, three books that is amazing and love taking time out. Oh, the, those are books that I can read again and again and again. It's just so inspiring. Reading a nice good book. Enrolling in a course. You're never too old to learn. And now that I'm an Aussie, I'm going to carry on studying. I love it. <laughs> so, so, you know, this taking up a hobby. Um, me and Antoinette in the end have been doing um, a bit of um, uh, crafts every now and then. We haven't done it for a while, but love. The end does these little earrings. And little, it's too cute, you know. We Just doing a hobby, and it gives us such joy just to do something, you know, mm. something different. Go somewhere. I know you go for walks in the morning, you know, just do something that is exciting and mm. just something new and gain new perspective. Fishing. Fishing. <laughs> <laughs> so in appreciating who we have in our lives and uh, developing our talents um, and our health. Of course, you know, I'm not very good at that, but yeah, exercise and, you know, <laughs> but also being, eat healthy and being thankful for the health we have. Because isn't that amazing, you know, that we are still healthy, healthy and how wealthy we are. We have so much to be thankful mm -hmm. for. We live in an amazing country where we have amazing opportunities. Um, yeah, it's, there's a lot to be thankful for. So, yeah. We spoke about behaviors of concern. We spoke about developing a positive uh, response to people and having a centered, person-centered approach. And then identifying our personal characteristics in, in self-reflection. And I think this contributes to understanding other people. It contributes to having being in touch with other people if you think a tiny bit about yourself and then you 
you you can maybe put yourself in that person's shoes and and then act towards that person in a way um, as if you're acting towards yourself and how would you appreciate somebody to uh, you know approach you in a way um, so those are the things that we've been covering so yeah just um, continue to make our lives meaningful and um, pursue passions and learn something new every day that's nice it's nice to just find something small you know, oh, always something learn something new, new. Always every day. Yeah, it's just amazing. I mean, if you can say, oh, I've learned something new today, yeah. you know, it's just incredible. It's a good way to wake up and feel, oh, well, what am I going to learn today? And yeah. you always learn something new. And put us, let's put our stamp, let's, let's leave a legacy by putting our stamp on our environment. Sometimes we can feel so insignificant because life's pressures and you know, our bosses and whoever, you know, try, we feel like we, we're not really significant, but we are, and we are leaving a legacy to saying as missionaries, we would say, it's no good, you go to a place and you're a missionary, you go and teach people this and that and that, and then you leave, and they all by themselves. If you're a good missionary, you go and you make more missionaries. You don't just go and just stand on your own little throne and be who you are. You have to impart yourself. Put some of yourself into the next generation. Make some more of yourself. You know, give your passion to the next person so that there can be more of you. You know, especially your good contrib contributions you have. Pass it on to the next person and the next person so that there can be more of you. And you don't have to do all the work. You don't have to be the only one. But you you pass uh, and you see your gifts and your um, abilities as as gifts that you can pass on to the next person. <coughs> yeah, and by understanding what is driving us, understanding people and appreciate people, that um, is the passion that we pass on, that we the legacy that we leave, and. Um, how we more successfully can interact with people. Um, then there comes this place where sometimes we fail. You know, sometimes we, we think we fail. I, I felt like I've failed because I'm not in White Haven anymore. I failed because I couldn't carry on. Um, so why do that? Ha why does that happen? So maybe because we didn't have the time, or we don't have the money, or we don't have the support, um, or we don't have the training, or fear, or um, something that's outside of our control. So there's probably more reasons, many more reasons, these are just some of them that I thought of, that um, why do we fail? And when we fail, then, you know, that could be a part of a crossroad in our lives as well where we fail and we're trying to figure out why that has happened um, and it's part of the process but when that happens the self-reflection in that is it, it's important identifying why something why does it affect me why did it hurt me and affect me when I got abused in Whitehaven why did it affect me so much more than what it did you um, my son abused me for years, so I came out of that domestic violence circumstance and I had to, and then it become, became too much, it just becomes too much, and then that's where it's so important to debrief, to go into a place where we actually have debriefing sessions, you know, that is such a huge need in dementia, where we can have a group where we can do a bit of debriefing. We do that when we get together and we, mm. you know, have a good old moan and, you know, it's part of debriefing and that's essential. And looking after your own mental health, that is so essential as well. Looking for help when you don't cope. Realizing when you don't cope, you know, I'm not coping anymore, I'm over emotional, I'm, you know, I'm angry all the time, I'm frustrated. Why am I feeling like this? part of the self-reflection, part of the process of, of 
putting yourself first because mm. to be yourself, uh, to be good to yourself, you have to be good to yourself first before you can be good to other people. And when you are not good to yourself, you're probably not going to be good to somebody else either. So, and when, you know, these behaviors happen, they have effect on us. They have effect on us. Why does it have effect on us? You know, it's, yeah, it's not right to be treated not well, and maybe they don't mean it, but it has effect on us. Um, how do we develop a positive response to them for ourselves? How do we stay positive within ourselves as well? We can see it from that perspective. Um, how do we approach people in a personal way? How do we approach ourselves and, you know, make ourselves the person-centered person first? And um, identifying all of those things in our lives. So, where can we find help and information? So, like I mentioned through this session, Tip Us Now is really very helpful. Um, I mean, there is always counselling. There's always counselling sessions everywhere. Dementia Australia, I have called them before when I've had issues in telling. Just, you know, I mean, their helpline is there for carers as well. So we can call them and say, oh, I really struggle with this. Mm. So, yeah. So thank you guys for coming to my session. I hope this has meant something for you. Is there any questions, any feedback? Very interesting. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Questions. Why did you think you failed? You didn't <laughs> fail. I just felt like that. I know I didn't, but I, I know that I put myself first, you know, and I know I had to put myself first. Well, that's good because that yeah. means that you've been trained properly and that we need to identify when we can't cope, and that's a good thing Yeah. because then you climbed the next bridge and went somewhere else and, and are doing more to help yourself, to help others, others yeah. to build something better, so that's yeah. good. Yeah. But so I suppose when somebody, yeah. were, you know, when I started off preparing this, I thought, oh, now I'm going to go and stand there and tell people about behaviors, but I couldn't deal with it, you know. <laughs> it's no, like, you, 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 you know, you know you did did. deal with it. So though. that's, you know, that's just how, you know, one can feel. Because and, you, right. you, yeah. you were actually quite brave by going and saying that you, I can't cope with this. Right. Yeah. And that, that, that you need to it. move yeah. somewhere You're else. You're still there. It's not dealing I mean, with it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was just, very hard yeah. to do as well. So yeah. you've done, you've done, you didn't fail did at all. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope I mean something for you guys. So oh, yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah. that's all right. Yeah.